Welcome to Keiko Vision, a podcast to pump you up to change the world. Hosted by me, Jordana. Let's get started. On this episode of Keiko Vision, I'm going to talk about the Keiko journey, which has really been the last five years, and how the universe has stepped in at key moments to show me the right path. So with that, let's get started. I've always gone by this, get comfortable with the uncomfortable. And it's a motto that the Navy SEALs use. And I remember in undergrad, it was the only time that I participated in an extracurricular activity. There was a management leadership organization called Darstock. And it was very selective. You had to interview to get in. And the interview process was intense. There was I I didn't have an interview process as intense as that interview for a job since. It was uh it was pretty crazy. I'll come back to that in a minute. But they asked why I wanted to be a member of the organization. And I said, because I I don't like talking. I don't like public speaking. I get nervous. I've got anxiety. It makes me so uncomfortable to even think about being here, which is why I want to be here. Because I know that the only way that I am going to reach somewhere near my full potential is to continue to put myself in uncomfortable situations. And if I go into it with that mindset, then it transforms what's possible. It brings me to tables that I would have never, never been at. So I am uncomfortable here, which is one of the reasons why I know I've got to do it. Okay, back to that crazy interview. This interview process, there was a panel interview there was some sort of project resolution where there were a bunch of candidates that had to work on a project together and have people looking at how you're interacting and what your leadership skills are. And it was very interesting. And that program was amazing and introduced me to meditation as a tool for stress relief. And I have turned to that when life gets shitty ever since. And I don't know why I usually wait until it gets to that point. And then I I go back to the things that I know help me. But I do. And I did. It wasn't until November of 2016 when my marriage was falling apart and the election results came in and I was so shocked and so furious at the results and, and needed to, to, to vent some frustration and, and, and definitely vented some frustration in the, the couple months that, that followed. I'm not the greatest at meditating and especially at that point in time, because at that point in time, I just meditated for short periods. I've now been meditating consistently for the last five years, but at that point it was, it was still difficult for me to shut off my brain. And it really took a lot of practice. I've got, ADD and my brain is all over the place. And so I got such great relief once I was able to flip that light switch because it's either it's on or off. I I'm either there or I'm not. And when I am not there, that's when, that's when the solutions present itself. That's when it's like the clear and obvious path forward. And People who are familiar with meditation will 
will tell you that it, it is like a superpower. It is amazing. And it's something that you can control. So I know a lot of people kind of poo poo it and think that they're too like, strong or tough or proud. I don't I don't know. Um, but it allows you to be a better version of yourself because it allows you to see yourself from a different perspective. And if you want to be a better version of yourself, it's something that I highly recommend. And when I meditated at that, at that time with all this rage and this frustration, it became clear that I needed to redirect that energy, that that was not healthy. And and so I chose to try to understand what was causing this hate and this divide and why social media had become toxic. Like, why were my aunts befriending me and, uh, you know, changing the Christmas party? So it fell when I was in school. I didn't understand it. And it started as just kind of a project to distract myself from dark period. And then I realized how bad life has gotten for so many people. It's like I was paying attention to me and my family and my career, which was fucking awesome. I, I didn't have passion. I wasn't passionate about reinsurance or insurance, but I loved what I did. And I got paid well for it. And I worked with great people. I had amazing clients and got to go to great places and then rack up all these miles and, and Marriott points so that when I'm taking my family for vacation, I don't have to pay for those expenses. If I did have a passion at the time, it was around technology and innovation. And I was really trying to incorporate that more at the company that I was working for. So I was working in, in underwriting, but I was bringing an innovation and technology aspect to our clients. And I was bringing our clients out to plug and play in Silicon Valley to introduce them to new technology and emerging technology and to rate pitches. And I was trying to start a an actual innovations department. Once I realized how difficult life has become for so many people and how that creates this atmosphere where there's just so much blame going around of why life is so shitty for so many people. And it's gotten to the point that it's affecting our lifespan. We are dying younger because of despair. And I needed to understand that. And the more that I peeled back from this onion, the worse it became. Because it's like, who's doing something about it? And the only things that are being done are the things that have been tried over the last bunch of decades. Because of my love for technology and innovation, I recognized how how much of a player that has been in really gutting our, our working class and how in the past that's really hit blue collar workers really, really hard. And um, it's coming for white collar. It's, it's already here. It's already affecting white collar jobs. It's just, it's affecting low level white collar and it's going to keep moving its way up. Once I realized how tied political polarization and economic inequality are, it's like, it makes sense, right? If people can buy our politicians and write the rules, then they're going to funnel more money to themselves. So I get it. It makes sense now. But it didn't give me comfort that anything was going to improve. And I'm looking at my kids and I see my one son who looks like his dad, acts like his dad, 
loves and idolizes his dad and I am not okay with it. I'm, I'm not okay with, with how life has become so difficult that, that we're dying from despair, that we're numbing ourselves with drugs. This time was complicated even further because I was in an executive MBA program. So it was a 16 month program. There were 10 of us in a cohort every Saturday, all day. We took a class trip to Prague in Switzerland. It was awesome, but it was such a crazy time in my life. And these guys didn't know me beforehand. <laughs> so they just thought I was batshit crazy. So we go on our class trip and I'm the one hanging out with locals. I went out on a date. I jumped off a bridge. Now, the bridge wasn't very high and the locals were doing it and I'm a good swimmer. So I wasn't overly concerned. But I got to see a different side of Switzerland. I hung out on the rooftop of one of the locals' family and talked about the multi-generational living and how common that is over there. The local I went on a date with was an expat, and shortly after he arrived in Switzerland, he was diagnosed with testicular cancer and had to have one of his balls removed. And I learned firsthand how awesome the care in Switzerland is. Something like that happens, you're taken care of. He started treatment right away, and not only did he not have to worry about paying a penny, he was paid by his company for the time that he was in the hospital. Now compare that to what would happen here. Most people can't even afford a flat tire, let alone dealing with a diagnosis like that. People in the U.S. have to start GoFundMes. This is why we're dying from despair. Other countries aren't dying from despair because they don't treat their citizens like this. We don't have a functional safety net. Just the stress of having to worry about the what ifs in life is enough to affect our quality of life. Stress has been linked to all sorts of ailments, including autoimmune diseases, which I suffer from and so do most of my friends. So grad school was a very interesting time in my life and I would literally pace back and forth in the class as much as I could before one of them would just start throwing shit at me and tell me to sit, sit down. But I met key people who advised me early on within their areas of expertise, whether it was data privacy or business automation or marketing. And even though it was one of the craziest times in my life, I do not regret a thing. It was amazing. The next time the universe stepped in was shortly after grad school. And I had signed this two-year agreement and was really stuck at the company that I was working at. And at the same time, I knew that technology and coming together and community was the way forward and, and that there needed to be some urgency behind that. Shortly after grad school was over, the company that I was working for was bought out and was relieved of the financial obligation to pay back grad school. It was pretty awesome. And it was like perfect timing. I branched out and started Cacao Technologies. And Cacao is the Hawaiian word for all inclusive. We're all in this together. And that's just, that's exactly what we need right now. We need people to, to put the collective community ahead of our own self-interests. And we need to start working on serious problems. And we need to do that now. And I was given this opportunity. And I left the corporate world and released the Keiko app, which was the first piece of technology. And I tried to get people around this idea of coming together and using technology for good and for the benefit of the individual members and of the community, the collective community. And nobody understood what I was, what I was trying to say. And I am not the best person to explain it. I understand that I failed miserably 
by the end of 2019, I was like, just really frustrated because I didn't think that that like getting people to try something that doesn't cost anything that has the power to do so much good. I just, I didn't think that getting people to try it was going to be a hurdle um, to the point that it, that it was. And so now I'm taking a different approach. Look, I'm I'm going to continue to pay for the multi-million dollar platform that continues to get updates and is fucking awesome and uses social media in a way that is positive and brings about good things and good feelings and not focused on the differences that we all have, but um, the shit that we can agree on. So I tried to explain all of this in 2019. It was like I was sounding an alarm bell, but there were so many alarm bells. All of the alarm bells are going off at once. And it's because all of these issues are connected. And they all stem from us putting the interests of billionaires and special interests before the interests of society. And because of that, and because we've let them write the rules, and because technology has created this winner-take-all environment, it has created mega billionaires. And the flip side of mega billionaires is despair. It's the despair that we are dying from. It's the despair that is reducing our expected lifespan. Since this podcast is new, we have no sponsors, so I will shamelessly plug Keiko. And if you get sick of hearing this, then reach out to become a sponsor. And if you think I'm crazy and must be smoking the good shit, check out NJ Canamama. Keiko, the social app. K-A-K-O. Keiko, the social app. K-A-K-O. Keiko, the social app. Keiko rules. Keiko, the social app. Billionaire greed, tech. Keiko the social app, destroying America. Keiko the social app, T minus seven years and counting. Keiko the social app. And with that, let's get back to the show. At the end of 2019, I was in a pretty bad spot. It's like I spent the year ringing alarm bells, and just like everybody else who's ringing alarm bells, it's just becoming white noise. People are too desensitized and nobody's paying attention. And that was really discouraging. And I knew that my current approach wasn't working. But I didn't know what I needed to do at that point. And I was getting significant pressure to return to the corporate world. To the point that people were starting to question my parenting for not. And that was one of the lowest points throughout this. And to be honest, that's something that still, I'm sure, continues. Right now, I, I avoid negative people. There's always going to be people who hate, and there's always going to be people who tell you that it's not possible. And then there will always be people who love you and who think that they're doing the best for you and for your family. And, and that's much harder. I got my resume ready, and I was still meditating at the time. Every, every bone in my body was telling me it was not the right direction, and I shouldn't do it. But I did, and I was in the editing stage. And then the universe just smacked me upside the head and reminded me of what I was trying to do and why I was here. And one of my best friends overdosed and needed Narcan to be revived. I met Paul initially because we, we both have very similar stories. 
his ex was an addict. Shortly after we met, his ex was in rehab for a month. And he went through a lot of the same things that I went through and had some of the same trust issues and just we could relate. He was earlier on at that point, they were separated, about to start the divorce process. And so I was trying to help him. I'd been there before. And we just became best friends pretty quickly. He told me after a couple of months that he also had an addiction issue and was in recovery. He didn't think that I would have let my guard down if he told me initially, and I don't know if I would have. That's something that just kind of goes up automatically. I, I don't know. But he was really stressed, and he said that he needed to go back to meetings. At the end of 2019, he was going to NA meetings regularly. And then in January of 2020, kick off that shitty year, um, he was at an NA meeting. He got a call from an old friend who owed him money and said that he had money and gave him payment in what used to be acceptable terms. And he was at a point where he took the drugs because he had been clean so long, it's much easier to overdose. And it's a different response after the overdose too. I can't imagine my life without Paul, especially over COVID. He ended up moving in with his kids so we could keep our families safe throughout COVID. And for somebody with as much stress as I have, having somebody who is very good at making me laugh and smile and relieving my stress was so important. I am so grateful because when I think of what COVID could have been like in different situations, um, that would have been, would have been pretty horrible. When Paul overdosed, I knew that I was going to take a different approach. I didn't care if Everybody that I loved and respected thought I was a terrible parent for it. I know in my heart that this was the right direction. And thankfully, I had been approached about consulting opportunity in the insurance industry. And that was able to, to really hold me over during the time when I was thinking about how I could present this, this material. Because one of the things that I learned throughout this is while I initially thought life is too bad, it is just so shitty that we need to create something better. We need to create a way that people can just easily contribute and live comfortably. And we can do that through technology. And I realized throughout this process that I want to do that. And after the last five years, I think I owe it to my kids. <laughs> so I spent that time consulting to pay for the platform expenses and, and kind of the basics necessities. And then I was setting up ways to share this material. And then the universe stepped in again because I was building lots of things I put together a series to release and put together templates so I could easily share the books and the, the movies, the documentaries, even like fictional movies or series, but has relevant themes. Just kind of share how this shaped 
the the vision. And I, I call that project mosaic because it's just all these tiny little pieces. But when you put them together, you see this 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 picture, and um, it's not good. It's not good. The idea for me was to automate the shit out of it. So I don't need a huge following. I need the right following. I want those who are curious but not sold. I want you guys to keep listening. But I need the 1%. The 1% who are still trying and who are still fighting. I need you to connect, to download the app, to form some groups, invite your friends, and share this vision so we find more awesome gems like you. The last time that the universe stepped in was I knew I was ready to reintroduce Keiko and to start sharing all of this information and all of these little pieces that have led me here. And at the same time, the company that I was consulting for had stacked up. So I knew that that was, that was going away and knew that I needed to like take this, this, the step. And I had decided to reintroduce the platform at least on November 11th, 1111, because that just keeps coming up. It's like every time I look at the clock, it's 1111 in the morning or 1111 at night. And I always make a wish. And the wish always has something to do with this and creating a better world. On that same day, I got an email asking if I wanted to participate in a story exchange at my son's school. And it was, it was really interesting. I had not participated in anything similar to that in the past. And you tell your story and then you listen to a story and then you tell the larger group the other person's story, but in a first person point of view. And as soon as I got the email, I signed up because I was like, I just picked 1111. And now I have this opening to at least tell my story to one person. Because as soon as I say it out loud, I'm going to hold myself to it. On 1111, I reintroduced the platform and also introduced the idea of this podcast and the Utopia vs. Dystopia series. And now I'm here talking to you and sharing this story and asking you to join on this journey. It's not always going to be easy, and I know I will piss you off at times. But you need to get pissed off. It's time. Keiko the social app. K-A-K-O. Keiko the social app. K-A-K-O. Keiko the social app. Keiko rules. Keiko the social.